Okay, here we're going to look at patterns of inheritance in Mendel. This is an example of a family tree or pedigree, and we'll be looking at these a little bit further. This is kind of like a basic introduction to heredity, uh, which is going to be our unit that we're going to go over. So starting with a family tree or pedigree that you may not um, initially think of, but I grow giant pumpkins. And we could see here this is a family tree or pedigree of one of the giant pumpkins that I grew back in 2013. For nomenclature purposes, it's the weight, and yes, that's 1,766 and a half pounds, the last name of the grower, and the year it was grown. And that's what precedes all of the lineage here. So you can see uh, my pumpkin here was grown from this seed, and you see the weight and the last name of the grower in the year, and that seed came from these pumpkins, so on and so forth. Now with pumpkins, you need to plant a seed in the ground, and you need a pollinator. So you need to develop the pollen from somewhere. So this is the lineage of the cross that I made with the pollinating plant. You can see it's one of my previous um, grown pumpkins here. Now in nature, pumpkins, uh, apples, things that require bees, bees could fly to any flower and go through and cross pollinate. How we know this lineage is as giant pumpkin growers were isolating the flowers. So what does that look like? Here's a little zoomed in version of uh, another seed that I grew with a picture here. We're putting in some way, in this case, a cup over the flower to isolate the cross, meaning no random bees came in. I would specifically take a flower, a male flower, from a pollinator and directly pollinate the female flower here. So that's how we're able to develop this lineage in this family tree through controlled and isolated crosses as giant pumpkin growers. So the reason I chose giant pumpkins gives you a little bit of a visual here. Here's a resulting pumpkin, and here's the seed that that pumpkin came from, and here's the pollinator. And you can see with pumpkins, you kind of get a blending sometimes. Here, this pumpkin took on the shape of its mother a little bit more, and the color from the pollinator, or its father. So you kind of get this mixture of shape from one, maybe color a little bit from another. It's kind of an in-between pumpkin from these two. Since we're talking about Gregor Mendel, it's a good thing he didn't do pumpkins. He was looking at pea plants. And a good thing, the reason why it's a good thing he was looking at peas and not pumpkins, is peas tend not to show these blended traits. They show a clear dominant recessive trait. There's no additive effect, there's no grading um, sliding scale. It's either it expresses it or it doesn't. It produces purple flowers or white flowers. Not pink or light purple or kind of off color. It's one or the other. And Mendel, in his Patterns of Inheritance, the tendency for traits to be passed from parent to offspring is called heredity. That's the main topic here. He was a, an Austrian monk who was the first person that really studied this um, and is considered to be the father of modern genetics. He worked with garden peas in his monastery, uh, and it's, like I said, it's a good thing he worked on pea plants, and it was from, he lived from 1822 to 1884. So he chose garden peas for several reasons from his standpoint. One, there's many distinctive varieties were available. They're small and easy to grow. You can grow a lot in a small area. Short generation time and lots of offspring. Very important, we do scientific tests. You want it to occur quickly. You want it to have a lot of sample size. Both male and female reproductive organs are enclosed within the same pea flower. It also helps for pollination and the able to go through and make these general crosses. Main distinctive varieties being available, in this case, this could be um, tall plants or short plants, this could be green pods or yellow pods, white flowers or violet flowers, so that was very important. Unlike a tomato, if you ever look at a tomato catalog, there's extensive and extensive amounts of varieties, and it can be hard to tell them apart. Here, pretty distinctive varieties. His experimental designs, what did it look like? Well, he selected seven char characteristics to study, and each had two distinguishable traits. He let each rice self-fertilize, meaning pollinate with itself, take the pollen from the same flower and pollinate itself with it. Uh, and it's, he developed what's called a true breeding. What true breeding means is that you take two parents here. If they're true breeding, you can cross them together. You get the same offspring. You cross those together, you get the same offspring. It shows consistencies. It breeds true from type. In this case, you have two purple flowers always producing purple flowers. That's what's called a true breeding variety, or purebred. True breeding line indicated right here, and there are these things called um, non-true breeding, where the offspring may produce initially what looks like the same, but in the C in the F2 generation, I'll move myself over a little bit here, in the F2 generation, right down, right down here, you're seeing that there's a white flower. 
and that white flower is because it's heterozygous. So up here, we have two heterozygous, right? We have a white and a purple. Over here now, we have two purple flowers, and they are both homozygous dominant, meaning they are going to be true breeding. And we could see throughout the whole life cycle um, over here that they're all true breeding. They're all purple. However, if you look at part B, now we're getting into some differences here. Our F1 generation looks the same. Phenotypically is the same, but genotypically is different. And our F2 generation is where we're noticing we have purple and also white flowers being produced. So the F1 is that first generation and F2 is that second generation. And this is a result of there being a heterozygous um, genotype here, even though the phenotype is the same. So it's experimental design. Let's look back over. Experimental design across two individuals from two different varieties that differ in only one trait. He had a purple and a white. Bred them together, got all purples, and the F2 generation again produced 75% purple and 25% white. We saw that in our previous crosses there. What he observed? We observed of the seven pairs of contrasting traits studied. He called this thing called dominant and recessive traits. So certain things um, would mask or hide other traits, and those were the dominant traits. And the recessive traits would simply not be expressed unless you had two alleles or two genes of that same recessive type. Now, I don't want you to think of recessive being negative because recessive traits aren't necessarily bad. It just means they are not shown only if they're, hetero if they're homozygous recessive. The dominant trait in a heterozygous will mask or hide that recessive trait, as we see here with our green pods and our yellow pods. In this case, if yellow is dominant, the genes for green are there, but all of the pods will be yellow because that's the dominant trait. Another example, what he observed, he's called Punnett squares. Uh, seeing two little bees, two big bees, we're seeing heterozygous, all the brown eyes. Here we take an indiv two individuals from these resulting offspring, we breed those together, and we see that we get 75% brown eyes, 25% blue eyes. That 3 to 1 ratio is the dominant recessive, is what we see here. And that's just repeated again. This is our pollen, this will be our male, and this will be our pistil from our female. And we're noticing the resulting genotype and also phenotype. We need to keep those in mind. So put that in perspective here, our genotype and phenotype. The genotype, there's 25% homozygous dominant, big B, big B. 50% heterozygous, big B, little b, and 25% homozygous, uh, homozygous recessive, and that case would be white. It's a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio for genotype. However, our phenotype is different. 75% purple, 25% are white. And that's just looking at them phenotypically, with, what they basically express. This is a result of uh, Mendel's experiment. He looked at many, many, many individuals. Again, a good thing that they were short um, generation time. And you could see here, our dominant recessive, he did the ratios out over a large sample size. And he pretty much got very close to that predicted 3 to 1 ratio. So this just helped prove um, the results that he was observing there. And this is how our Punnett squares are able to take this and try to present it in a clean ratio form. Even though it may not be 100% exact, it's going to be very close observed, even in large numbers.